Hi, and welcome to the Bruce Channel. I'm Bruce, and it's been quite a week. So come on in. We'll see what uh, <laughs> what kind of mischief we can create for this week. All right, first up. There isn't a week that goes by without someone of note dying. And if we drop the qualifier of note, on average, nearly two of us die every second worldwide. Actually, 1.8 something. Still, it was a bit more than coincidental when two more than notable icons died this week just days apart. We're both Englishmen, both of cancer, both at age 69. I'm speaking, of course, about David Bowie and Alan Rickman. And in both cases, no one knew. Well, not literally. I'm sure family and loved ones knew. But in neither case was it revealed in advance that there was illness. That's not always the case. Sometimes we're aware that someone's got an illness or a terminal illness, but for Messrs. Bowie and Rickman, they did a very good job keeping it private. All right, I want to show you something cute. It's on a Facebook page called Shared Humor. There are lots of funny videos there, but <laughs> there's this one, and it strikes a chord within me. It's called Dogs in Boots for the First Time. Now, as it happens, I can relate to it because some years ago I had a wonderful dog named Rufus. Finnish Spitz. Rufus, who was a she, had a very thick undercoat, as Spitzes do, and also because maybe genetics, she loved the cold. She was happiest when it was cold and windy and snowy, and she just loved to be outside. But her paws, whether the, the size or the exact shape, the conformation, the, the way the fur was, nevertheless, in the snow, she would quickly develop these snow balls, these ice balls on her feet, and would clog up and become very painful for her to walk. So one year I got her boots, and this, <laughs> this is exactly how she walked in them. Um, we have to take another look at this one, don't we? And this one, <laughs> this one could join the circus. All right, shared humor is the Facebook page. You can find a lot of cute videos. So a month, month and a half ago, I saw a promo for an upcoming episode of the Dr. Oz Show, and it caught my attention because the subject was sugar and the sugar wars. So I set the DVR, and, you know, I'd learned a fair amount about sugar as I did my research for my book. That was like, what, two and a half, three years ago. And I wanted to see if there were any new developments. Now, Dr. Oz is a cardiologist, if you don't know that. He had as his guest Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who is a neurosurgeon. <laughs> they had some interesting back and forth. Anyway, as I wrote in my book, one of the most important changes I'd made to my diet was including lots of fiber. You see, orange juice and apple juice, they have almost as much sugar as Coca-Cola. And because the body wants to keep the blood sugar levels even when it gets a spike, which is what happens with Coca-Cola or orange juice, it asks for insulin. Insulin's job is to reduce the blood sugar and take it back to a safe level. And it does that by metabolizing some of it and turning anywhere from like 20-25% of it directly into fat. Directly. But apple doesn't cause that kind of spike. That is, an apple because the sugar is released in the bloodstream more slowly because of the apple, the fiber. So, on the show, they talked about that. They even used some, some cute props to illustrate how that works. They also had a discussion about what's known as the sugar wars. What's that? Well, a few years ago, sugar growers, cane and beet, were upset that the corn industry was claiming that high fructose corn syrup was exactly the same as sugar. Not corn syrup, which is, you know, you might pour that over your pancakes, but high fructose corn syrup. And as I learned, they're not the same. And doctors Oz and Gupta talked about some of that, too, and they even included some discussion from one of my authorities, the, one of the authorities I cite in my book, Dr. Robert Lustig. Dr. Lustig has several videos out there. But the first one went viral and virtually made him a rock star. All right, so when they discussed when sugar started to become added to everything, it was when we went low-fat. That's decades ago. Low-fat, as likely you know, means low taste. So um, make it taste good, add sugar. That whole low-fat thing is a misdiagnosis anyway. It turns out butter is a lot better for you than margarine. Anyway, what really surprised me was how sugar and or high fructose corn syrup have become 
an ingredient in almost everything. Now, I'm careful what I eat, but they showed some things that had added sugar that were surprising. You know, I'm not surprised if it's in some salad dressings or some barbecue sauces or an applesauce. Or applesauce is easy, just get non-sugar added. But I was floored when they said that sugar is now being added to some meats. Really? Yeah, really. So, if just for learning that, I was glad that I watched it. I mean, if you want to learn more, well, you could read my book. <laughs> or any of the other books that I cite as the authorities for the authorities I use to write my book. But if you just like to watch this episode of Dr. Oz, simply Google Dr. Oz, Gupta, Hidden Sources of Sugar, and it'll get you to the episode. It's online, and it aired near the end of November last year. I do wish they fully revealed the dangers of high fructose corn syrup, but overall I thought they offered some good insight. Oh, and that revelation that sugar's in meat, I went and I checked various packages of you know, bacon and hot dogs and sausage. And yeah, sure enough. Hey, let me tell you about my book, Shrink. For most of my adult life, I weighed a little over 100 pounds, not much more than in this picture taken when I was about 17 and considering becoming a jockey. But as is often true, once I crossed into my 40s, extra weight came and it stayed. For years, I tried to lose, instead gained, and ended up 153 pounds. And I'm embarrassed to show you this video. Then I learned that it isn't about calories and exercise, but instead it's about what you eat. You might say, sure, ice cream makes you fat. But there were surprises. Things like orange juice not being such a wise choice if you're trying to lose weight. So I just made some basic changes to what I ate, not how much, and the weight just fell off. Now, nearly three years later, it is still off. And don't misunderstand, I'm eating foods I like, not bamboo shoots. Friends ask me how I did it so often, I put it in a book. It's available as an ebook for all platforms, and the print edition is available at barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. Hey, you can shrink too. All right, welcome back. Remember, you can watch all our previous shows at tinyurl.com slash Bruce Channel or at our Facebook page and you can write us at the Bruce Channel at yahoo.com. So, <laughs> I guess I proved with last week's football picks that indeed I did not secretly await the results of Saturday's game before picking. I was two out of four for the NFL, 50%. But if you know which games I picked and if you watched the games or even if you just read the accounts of the games, you would realize that I am 50% and only by a hair's breadth, by, uh, by the surface tension of a soap bubble. So, okay, my first pick wasn't really a pick, and I said as much. I said no way to logically choose Houston over Kansas City, but they had a soft spot for their quarterback, Brian Hoyer, played for the Browns, grew up in Cleveland, and it would have been hard for any quarterback anywhere, anytime to play worse than he did, and they got skunked 30 to nothing. I did think that Washington might upset Green Bay. Well, that was also proved as fantasy football. I'm not sure you're of a third kind. Well, but I did pick both Seattle and Pittsburgh to win. <laughs> oh, boy. And the thing is, if you know anything about those games, I should have won neither of them. Saturday night, Pittsburgh's got 22 seconds left. They're trailing. Ben roethlisberger has got a bad shoulder. And bang, bang, on one play, he throws incomplete. But Cincinnati commits, before another play is played, two personal fouls. Count them, two. First, the personal foul on the receiver, and then a personal foul. 15 yards plus 15 yards. Turns it into a chip shot field goal. Wins the game for the Steelers. Wow. Then on Sunday, the, the bitter cold that was forecast did indeed show up. Minnesota, though, had it won. It was not a high-scoring game. It was brutally cold. And... Yeah, Adrian Peterson fumbled, and Seattle recovered, and they went ahead for the first time in the entire game, 10-9. to 9. But a magnificent two-minute drill by the Vikings, including their second-year quarterback, Teddy Bridgewater, brought them close. All I need here is a 27-yard field goal. Time expiring. It seals the deal. Everybody knows it's over. You could see it. The Seahawks' faces were, how did this happen? Except it wasn't over. Place kicker, Blair Walsh, he'd already made um, several field goals. He, he made three, but he missed the fourth. So, you know, 
I've said I pick with intuition as well as logic, and I can't claim to have intuited these strange games, but if you include last week's four games and last year's Super Bowl, that means in the last five postseason games, I am three out of five. I'm correct on three out of five, and in all three, <laughs> I'm only right because crazy, nobody could possibly believe it kind of ending. Anyway, onward. Most diehard fans think this is the best weekend of all, because there were four games last weekend, and there'll be four games this weekend. But last week included the six seeds. This presumably is the strong four games that are strong teams. All of them have a legitimate shot. Could be really good. And I admit, challenge to pick. So, game one Saturday, Chiefs go to Foxborough and take on the Patriots. Tom Brady is a great quarterback. He'll be Hall of Fame. Bill Belichick is a Hall of Fame coach. And they're at home... And last year, of course, there was the talk of the plate gate, so there's probably a chip on their shoulder. They'll have attitude. They want to prove that there was nothing illegitimate, illegitimate about last year's victory. And more intuition than rationale. I go Kansas City. All right, Saturday night, another hard one. Packers at Cardinals. Aaron Rodgers is maybe the best quarterback in the game right now. He's in his prime. If he gets a running game at all, and he's got time to pass. He can pass with unsurpassed accuracy. Phoenix had a Cinderella year, and their quarterback is no slouch. Carson Palmer was number one overall in the year he was drafted. And Bruce Arians is coach of the year, what, two out of the last three years, something like that? And they're at home, Cardinals. On Sunday, the early game is the toughest of all, I think. Now, I said last week I like the Seahawks to go all the way if they could get out of frozen Minnesota alive, and they did. And... Well, okay, it did take that last second missed field goal, but they did. They survived. Meanwhile, the Panthers were the last undefeated team. They have the best overall record in the entire league, 15-1. and one. And Cam Newton may be this year's MVP. And running back Jonathan Stewart is returning after some injury. Luke Keesley, linebacker, is always a defensive player of the year candidate. And cornerback Josh Norman may be too. They have eight all-pros. This is... This is a good team. But you know, living here, I've seen a lot of their games. And listen, they could win this. But too many times, it just seemed as if, yes, they won, but they just as easily might have lost. In game 14, they beat the New York Giants, but they had a huge lead. The game should have been over. They let the Giants come back, and the final was 38-35. So, I don't know. Seattle's defense is suffocating. Carolina's defense is, by comparison, merely really good. So, the honest pick, you know, I live in Carolina, but I think I stay with Seattle. All right, then the late game Sunday, and this is the easy one, sad. It's in Denver, home field, Broncos. Peyton Manning returns to his starting role. His arm certainly isn't what it once was, but his on-field savvy remains the best in the game. The Steelers are really beat up, really hurting. D'Angelo Williams, running back. May not return yet. He hurt his foot weeks ago. If he does, he might be limited. And as mentioned, Ben Roethlisberger has a bad shoulder. He may not play at all. And if he does, he certainly can't throw it downfield. Oh, and his best receiver? Antonio Brown is amazing, but he's out on concussion protocol. That concussion came about. I told you about it. It was the first part of the previously mentioned two successive personal fouls committed by the Bengals last week. Ball's over his head, and the guy comes in and hits him in the head, and now he's out with a concussion. Oh, <laughs> and Denver started the season with little offense, but they kept winning because of a really good defense, especially their secondary. So, you know, after the Browns, I root for the Steelers. I don't think even Alba's Dumbledore could summon enough magic to not end the season for the Steelers. Oh, I did make one other pick last week. I chose Alabama over Clemson in the college championship. And Clemson, they played great. They showed why they ended the season at number one. And yet, they had, Alabama had a perfect, perfectly executed onside kick. And they needed that. It turned, changed the momentum of the game. But Clemson ended the season number one. But Crimson Tide ended the game as number one. Okay, the Republicans had their debate Thursday night. Honestly, this two-tier thing has become bizarre. All right, three on the undercard. Carly Fiorona was downgraded, as was Rand Paul, 
but he thumbed his nose at that system. He didn't show. Good for him. And I say that because there were seven on the main stage, and the four others, they've already had a debate with 11, so why not just put all 11 on one stage? So instead, the undercarders have to slog and they have to smile. It's got to be humiliating. There were lots of empty seats during that first debate. And then even without Rand Paul at either one, the whole night had more bluster and bombing and yes you did and mine's bigger than yours and, and it was very predictable too. Ted Cruz has taken on the number two slot behind Donald Trump. So naturally, that's whom Trump went after the most. So he's picking on whether Cruz is a natural born citizen since he was born in Canada. Meanwhile, <laughs> this got funny, Marco Rubio was picking on everybody. Because when you get past the three outsiders, Trump, Ben Carson, and Mrs. Arena, he wants to capture the votes of the establishment. Well, so does John Kasich, and so does Jeb Bush. But it was funny because in last month's debate, Jeb Bush was picking on Rubio, and the senator responded with, obviously someone in your campaign thinks you can pick up some points by going after me. So Rubio goes after Buddy, and this time Chris Christie quoted him, and said, well, someone must have told him the same thing. <laughs> Ted Cruz did fight back. He fought back against Rubio and Trump, but he also managed to punch himself in the nose when he mocked Donald Trump's New York values. The Trumpster did a good back of hitting him back on that, but then the next day, the New York Daily News had this on the front page. Now, it may not be likely that the Republicans win New York next November, but if the candidate for the Republicans were to turn out to be Ted Cruz, it is a lock he loses New York. Oh, and for what it's worth, the crazy blonde said last September that Ted Cruz was obviously eligible, but she's a trumpet to her. <laughs> That's what she is. She's a trumpet. She's a trumpet these days, so now she says he's not eligible. But, you know, that's the crazy blonde doing her thing. Oh, yeah. On Tuesday night, South Carolina Nikki Haley, South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, made the Republican response to President Obama's State of the Union address, and she acquitted herself well. Maybe she's auditioning for the vice presidential slot. She called for greater civility. She called for less hate-mongering, less anger. <laughs> Crazy Blonde then tweets, Deport Nikki Haley. All right. So a couple of Fridays ago, Tom's Miss Call made its debut at a film festival in Augusta, Georgia. Now, I've said post-production takes a long time. We shot this back in May. Anyway, I'm going to show you a few clips, but let me set the premise. Tom works in an office and discovers a very strange-sounding voicemail on his phone. He's trying to decipher what's being said, what's going on. His co-workers all give a listen. They all have varying ideas what's actually going on. Some of them are pretty outrageous. I play Eric, one of Tom's co-workers. And Eric is, uh, how shall I put it? A rather special individual. So, looking at it, I think I could have done better. But, you know, that's probably something all of us can say about virtually anything we have ever done. Anyway, some of the effects were absolutely awesome. Take a look at this opening sequence. and here's some of the conversations mm. 
Well, it's actually funny hearing it a second time. You know, yeah, I think someone just butt dialed me. That's a frantic cry for help from some poor soul locked in the trunk of a car. Mm-mm. Please again, I'll demonstrate. That sound there, that's the sound of a poor soul trying to prise open the lid. No, it's not. And then, yes, he says, someone help. I think he says something about milk. There, that next sound, that's him dickling with the lid. The lock cracks open, he lifts the lid, and towering above him, this maniac is standing over him saying, gotcha. That's a different voice. Mm. That's a crazed maniac. That's our kidnapper. No, no, no. At the top of every cell phone tower, there's a control panel, much like an old laptop. Chuck is walking the line between madness and genius, and I like it. It's a good thing you're driving, Chuck. I'm so excited going up in a cell tower and all. We need to listen to that message again. Why don't you make yourself useful and try to find a cable or something for us to plug it into the stereo? A core? Well, I may have one. I've got lots of stuff. You don't know what you have in your own car? I've had many things and many cars. Someday the twain shall meet. Okay, so obviously I'm not going to reveal everything to you. Not all the jokes, not the outcome, yada, yada, yada. But if you Google Tom's missed call, you can find it on YouTube. Okay, finally this. Maybe some of you have seen it. More than a few friends have shared it on their Facebook page. So I look at it. It looks good. And it sounds easy enough to make. With chicken, avocado, tomatoes, some onions, some lemon juice, romaine, lettuce. So I go get the stuff. And I'm... <laughs> I'm like helpless. I mean, I'm playing with this avocado. And it was... Uh, <laughs> it was the Kansas City Chiefs, and I'm the Houston Texans. I need avocado lessons. Really? So I I go online, and sure enough, here's a video. Here's how you do it. You cut all the way around the top, all the way to the bottom, and back up again. Twist the halves apart. Stick a knife in the pit. Turn it like a key. Pull it out. Peel back the outside. So I look at that. Sure, I can do that. Like hell I can. <laughs> I was able to cut all the way around. And yes, I was able to twist the halves apart. But then, they, 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 that's all, folks. Once again, it was the Chiefs versus Houston. The pit did not come out easily. Instead, it broke into chips. And I spent another five to ten minutes on each half. And the peeling? <laughs> You've seen magicians, right? You know there's a secret to the trick. The girl isn't really cut into pieces. And the arrow doesn't really go through her torso. So I, I look at that avocado video, and I don't know what the trick is, but I suspect there's a secret they're not telling because it was nothing. My experience was nothing like that video. Anyway, you know what? Avocado, schmavocado, I'm just going to buy guacamole sauce from now on. If you know what the secret is, write and let me know. Or, if you give avocado lessons, let me know where, when, how I can take them. And whether you do battle with avocados this week or not, I hope it's the best week you've ever had.